Hello, I'm Doug Robinson. I'm the chairman of the board of Smart Colorado. Welcome. I'd like to welcome and thank all of you for attending. We are pleased that so many elected officials, members of state and local agencies, donors, youth serving organizations, parents, and citizens have taken time out of your busy schedules to join us. This means a lot. Thank you for supporting our mission to protect youth from the impact of marijuana commercialization. Smart Colorado is comprised of thousands of citizens who stepped up to look after kids when Colorado voters approved recreational marijuana for adults 21 years of age and older. We are not about undoing the will of the Colorado voters, but are adamant that the state prioritize the health and safety of its kids and citizens ahead of prioritizing short-sighted marijuana profits and tax revenues. From the beginning, we decided not to take money from the marijuana industry, nor do we receive any state tax revenue derived from marijuana sales. We rely solely on private donations from foundations and a broad base of volunteers who generously donate their time, talents, and resources. We are committed to ensuring there are adequate safeguards for kids. As we've seen firsthand, marijuana regulations are having to play catch up to the constant innovations of today's new and different commercial products, potencies, and methods of use, which even today are vastly different than those that existed when marijuana was first legalized. These safeguards include capping THC potency, limiting products that appeal to kids, restricting marketing that influences kids, ensuring there are adequate public disclosures at the point of sale, treating mer medical marijuana more like a medicine, improving reporting on the impacts of today's high potent THC, and more robust education and prevention for those under the age of 21. As we approach our year eight of commercial sales in Colorado, we are pleased to announce our new initiative, One Chance to Grow Up. As other states have also voted to allow commercial sales, we must be responsible and share our experience with tools, advice, and expertise. We will always be grounded in Colorado, but after all, kids everywhere only have one chance to grow up and re providing resources to all communities is our way of ensuring that our kids and our communities are safe. Thanks to two generous foundations, we have today a two for one matching grant for all new financial supporters. Please know that your donations will only go to further our work. Please go to onechancetogrowup.org to see our new web website and to make your contribution. We'd like now to have you meet Robin Noble, a Colorado mom willing to share her story about her family impacted by highly potent marijuana. I have a son who in his freshman year in high school became very quickly addicted to high potency THC. And it happened so fast, the dependence was so intense we really didn't know what was happening until a lot of damage had been done. My son has recovered now, um, but I found a deep comfort in being able to connect with SMART Colorado to finally understand what was happening. SMART was one of the only um, places that had very reliable data they have always answered any question I've had immediately. And then, you know, as we've come out of the pain of addiction and I've moved more into a place of wanting to help and warn other parents about what might be coming their kids' ways, I've just found that SMART has been intensely involved in letting people know, educating the public, educating legislators, um, and connecting dots. So when you're a parent in crisis, you're kind of out there all by yourself. You're ashamed, you are scared, and you can't find great information. Once I found SMART, they were able to connect me with people who understood a lot about what was happening for my son. And that was just an absolute godsend. Thank you very much. I'm just very happy to hear your son is, is on the other side of this, um, but I'm sorry that you and your family had to go through this.
I now have the distinct honor of introducing the Assistant Secretary of HHS, responsible for mental health and substance use and the head of SAMHSA. Dr. McCants Katz joins us today from just outside Washington, DC. Dr. McCants Katz received her PhD from Yale and is a graduate of the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. She is board certified in general psychiatry and addiction psychiatry. Dr. McCants Katz has served in both the Obama and Trump administrations and was previously the California Medical Director of Alcohol and Drug Programs. Welcome, Dr. McCants Katz. We're so pleased that you're taking time to share your thoughts with us today. My video. I think she is joining us uh, here. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, and it, it's really, it's really um, um, my my privilege to have the opportunity to speak to all of you today. And what I'm going to do is give you kind of a quick update on marijuana uh, from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, where I serve presently. So let me just take a minute to to kind of review where we're at with marijuana. Right now, marijuana is pretty widely available in our country. 33 states, the District of Columbia, Guam, and Puerto Rico all allow medical use of marijuana. 14 states and territories have legalized recreational use. And Congress right now is considering national legislation that would legalize uh, marijuana across the nation. Uh, the impetus of this is really the work of a, of a huge and very profitable industry that markets heavily with health claims based on anecdote, uh, very little evidence to support the medical uses of marijuana. And these, um, these claims have really had virtually no counter arguments put forward until the last few years. Um, marijuana is a drug that just about any way you could think of putting it in your body, there's a marijuana product that can do that. You can smoke it, you can eat it, you can use it as an oil and vape it, you can use it as a lotion, you can even use it as a transdermal patch. And marijuana is a changing drug. This is what I think people don't understand. It is not the drug from when people like me were adolescents and young adults. It's a different drug. When I was preparing this presentation, I was kind of looking around the internet to see if I could find anything uh, from users about what they think about marijuana today. And these are a couple of quotes that I found. This is a quote um, that I've referenced. If anybody wants to look, they could look it up. Uh, here's somebody who said, I miss the days of being able to maintain a consistent all day high and only pass out at bedtime. Now I pass out way too early and too often. Hard to regulate the buzz with such potency. And then somebody answers back and says, I'm with you. I used to smoke a quarter bag a day easily. Can't even do half of one hit nowadays. This is a different drug, folks. Uh, we have seen increasing THC content. DEA uh, manages this and tests what they find out in communities in terms of THC content of marijuana. They've done this for many years. It was about 4% in the 1990s. That went up to 12% in 2014. And now in 2020, it's 20% and higher. Not only that, we have products that really um, uh, put a lot of THC in extract forms. So these extracts have THC levels that exceed 50%, sometimes as high as 75%. These extracts are often used with other marijuana products. So people who are using marijuana are often getting very high amounts of THC. And you know, THC is that component responsible for euphoria. It's responsible for intoxication that people feel, but it also has some very, um, very strong negative effects. It can produce anxiety, agitation, paranoia, and frank psychosis. And we also know the National Institute on Drug Abuse has studied this, and they tell us 10 to 20% of users will develop use disorders. So it's a fairly addictive drug as well. The risks and out adverse outcomes associated with marijuana are many. They are downplayed by the industry and they are ignored by the states. They include everything from low birth weight babies to lung disease, to motor vehicle accidents, to cognitive impairment and cognitive decline over time with chronic use, poor performance in school and at work, mental disorders, addiction, and these risks 
of adverse outcomes are greatest in our children and young adults. We struggle to get information about the health risks of marijuana out to the public. This is, this is data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And what I'm showing you here is that marijuana is the most used of illicit drugs in Actually, 20... Cats, I'm yes. going to interrupt you. Can you share your screen? So, so what, if you saw this slide, what you would see is that from our 2019 National Survey on Drug Use and Health, marijuana is the most used of the illicit drugs, uh, much greater utilization of marijuana than other drugs, including opioids, including cocaine, including methamphetamine and heroin. Uh, this 48.2 million Americans using in 2019, a significant increase from 2018, and that increase uh, in 2018 was an increase over 2017. So the message here is that marijuana use is going up very, very substantially in this country. So why is it that marijuana use is going up so much in our country? Well, one reason, this is a question again we ask on the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. We ask people in various age groups, how much risk do you think there is in using certain substances. Uh, we look at it in, in our youth. Uh, this is adolescents, 12 to 17 years old. We ask them about how much risk is there in smoking marijuana regularly, using cocaine, using heroin, uh, drinking alcohol nearly every day, smoking cigarettes. And what you see there is that about 35% of youth think that marijuana uh, use regularly has risk with it. Um, it's, they think the risk of smoking cigarettes is far greater than the risk of marijuana use. And of course, they do understand that cocaine, heroin, heavy alcohol use, that those are risky things to do. But marijuana, uh, most of them, the, 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 the great majority, do not think there is risk in, in regular marijuana use. And when we look at our young adults, 18 to 25, again, we see that only, only about 15%, what you're seeing here, is perception of risk among uh, of substance use among 18 to 25 year olds over a four year period from 2016 to 2019, which is our most recent data. And in young adults, even fewer of them think that regular marijuana use is harmful. And again, far more think that smoking cigarettes is much more risky than regular marijuana use. Next slide. This next slide you should see is a slide of marijuana use. And yeah. what I'm doing here now is showing you uh, some variables that we look at in the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, how Colorado looks compared to national numbers. And it's going to be a little difficult for me because part of the screen is blocked. But what you see here is that marijuana use is going up in all age groups nationally, adolescents, young adults, and adults 26 and older. Um, when we look at Colorado by comparison, you have a 41% higher, higher prevalence of marijuana use in your adolescence than the national average. You have a 61% higher prevalence of marijuana use in your 18 to 25 year olds. And if you look at adults in Colorado, uh, 26 and older, um, compared to the national average rate of marijuana use, you, the adults in Colorado have an 84% higher rate of marijuana use than the national average. Next slide. And when, and when we have such high rates of marijuana use, people do develop addiction to marijuana. We call that marijuana use disorder. And what you see here is that nationally, uh, very unfortunately, we are seeing significant increases in rates of marijuana use disorder in adolescents 12 to 17 years old. But when we look at Colorado, in your adolescence, the rate of addiction to marijuana is twice what we're seeing in the United States at large. Next slide. And we have a lot of concerns about marijuana use in pregnancy. Uh, when I first came to SAMHSA uh, in my role as Assistant Secretary in 2017, I was looking at the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and I was very concerned about an increase in marijuana use in pregnancy. Um, there, and the reason for that is that we have accumulating data about the risk of marijuana use by pregnant women. There is emerging data on the ability of, a mar of marijuana to cross into the fetus from the placenta. Uh, 
We see fetal growth restriction. We see preterm births. We see higher rates of neonatal intensive care unit admissions. And marijuana exposure during development has been associated with problems with neurological development, including attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and limitations in cognitive function. Next slide. And so SAMHSA made a lot of efforts to address this situation. We published two evidence-based practice guidebooks uh, warning about these risks in, in pregnant women and in youth. Uh, we launched SAMHSA.gov slash marijuana, which has a lot of really good information for the public. Uh, we uh, asked our technology transfer centers to focus on prevention of marijuana and other substance misuse in their trainings. And we worked with the Surgeon General to disseminate a marijuana advisory that addressed health risks for youth and pregnant women. Women. And this is data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And, and again, looking from the years 2016 to 2019, and what you see is that uh, 2017, that year where we saw the, the increase in illicit substance use by pregnant women led by the use of marijuana. In 2018, with the efforts we made, we were able to push that down some. But if you look at 2019, you see those numbers creeping up again in terms of marijuana use among pregnant women. And this is a very, very concerning issue because pregnant women who use marijuana have lots of other issues and problems that often are not thought about. Again, data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and what you see here is a comparison of women who do not use marijuana to women who do use marijuana during pregnancy. And women who are pregnant and using marijuana are much more likely to use cocaine, hallucinogens, stimulants, including methamphetamine, tranquilizers and sedatives, and opioids and they are much more likely to use alcohol and to binge use alcohol. They are more likely to have suicidality, major depression and major depression with severe impairment. These are women who need our attention, they need our help and our care, and so do their children. Marijuana is associated with a lot of negative events. Serious mental illness, is also unfortunately going up in the United States. Again, National Survey on Drug Use and Health showing a significant increase in young adults 18 to 25 with the overall national rate of 8.6% for serious mental illness. But if we look at Colorado, your rates are even higher at 11.6% of your 18 to 25 year olds with serious mental illness. That's a mental illness that impairs your day-to-day -day function. You're not going to be able to have as much success in life if you don't get effective care and treatment for the, that mental illness. Next. And if we compare uh, the national average to Colorado on several variables, which I've given you here, past month marijuana use in young adults, significantly higher rates. 37% of your young adults are current marijuana users. Daily users, young adults, nearly 15% are daily users of marijuana. In terms of past month marijuana use in adults 26 and older, again, nearly 19% are. Those with substance use disorders, anyone 18 and older in Colorado, again, much higher than the national average at nearly 11%. And co-occurring substance use disorders and serious mental illness in adults 18 and older, again, in Colorado, you're about nearly twice the national average. Next. Major depressive episodes going up in the United States, particularly in our young people, in our adolescents, and also in our 18 to 25 year old population. This shows adults. And what we see here is that in Colorado, your numbers are about 23% higher than the national average for major depression in young adults. Next. And when we look at data directly out of Colorado, this is from Roberts and colleagues. They looked at people coming into emergency department and urgent care centers to get treatment for complications of marijuana use. And you see increasing numbers of people seeking that care from 2005 to 2015 and increasing numbers with behavioral health issues related to the marijuana use. Um, on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, what you see is increasing rates of suicide in Colorado and increasing rates of suicide with marijuana present in the decedent. Next. 
and this is a, an important uh, study that came out last year. Uh, there had been uh, this belief based on an earlier study that states with more liberal marijuana, medical marijuana laws had lower rates of opioid overdose deaths. Um, this was studied from 1999 to 2010, a 21% decline in opioid overdose deaths in liberal marijuana states was shown. People like me, frankly, said, well, wait, why don't you study this for a few more years? That happened, and Shover and colleagues have now re reanalyzed that data from 1999 to 2017. Not only, not only do we see a complete turnaround in that finding from the earlier study, we see a 23% increase in opioid overdose deaths in states that have liberal medical marijuana laws. This is really very important because what it shows is that marijuana is not going to solve your opioids issues. It's going to worsen them. When we look at marijuana health risks, our national survey on drug use and health shows us the relationship of marijuana use with depression, suicidality, serious mental illness, and psychotic illness. In adolescents, it's associated with increased risk for psychotic disorders in adulthood and is linked with suicidal behavior. Colorado saw increased suicidality with marijuana use reported in 2016. Nearly 31% of your suicides in children, children 10 to 19 years old, had marijuana present. And that was compared to alcohol, where only 9.7%, uh, much lower levels of alcohol present in these folks who took their lives. The risk for psychotic disorders we know increases. How does it increase? With frequency of use, with potency of the product, and with the age at first use. Marijuana is a substance that is not safe for our children and our young adults. And we see a study here, Meyer et al. did this study of over a thousand people and they did this over about 25 years. They followed people for IQ, they followed them for marijuana use and meeting criteria for marijuana use disorder. And what you see here is that there is a decline in IQ score as a person has greater exposure to marijuana. Up to six IQ points lost. The average IQ is 100. That's a 6% loss of intellect. That has consequences for people trying to live their lives successfully. Next. And this is a, a combination of studies going on in Australia and New Zealand. They were looking at people who started using marijuana before age 17 and followed them up to age 30 years old. A large study. Uh, up to 3,700 people, and they looked at adverse outcomes. Um, what you see here are yellow bars for less than monthly use to the very uh, red bar, which is daily use. What you see is the more marijuana you use, the more likely you are to develop a cannabis use disorder, to use other illicit drugs, to make a suicide attempt. You're less likely to finish high school. You're less likely to get that advanced degree, and you're more likely to be on social welfare programs as an adult. Next. So what can the federal government do? The federal government really has a responsibility to inform our people of the risks of marijuana so that they can make informed choices. I'm an addiction medicine specialist. Uh, I have been doing this my entire career. I do not think people should be prosecuted, incarcerated because they have drug problems, but I do think they have every right to know what the risks are and to make their choices. SAMHSA does this through collection of NISDA data and the Drug Abuse Warning Network related to marijuana findings. Um, we develop materials aimed at educating the public and practitioners about these issues. We require the use of evidence-based practices for mental and substance use disorders. We do not allow grant dollars from SAMHSA to be used by grantees who would use marijuana to treat mental and substance use disorders. Why do we put that restriction in place? Because marijuana is not a treatment for mental and substance use disorders. It is a strong risk factor for the development of mental and substance use disorders and worsening those conditions in people who use marijuana. We also fund prevention, treatment, and recovery services in states and communities. Next slide. What else can we do? Well, SAMHSA doesn't do much research, but we do some, and we usually do it with our own surveys. This is the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. We looked at 
24,900 uh, dyads, parent and uh, offspring dyads, uh, looking at parental, no, parental uh, marijuana use and looking at what kind of drug use were, was present in, in their children. And what we found is that parental marijuana use is a risk factor for offspring substance use and misuse, including not just marijuana, but tobacco, alcohol, and opioids. And so it's really important that we think this through and prevent a multi-generational substance use issue in families. What parents do influences what their children do, be that environment, be that genetics, it's a combination. It is a real worry and it should be a national priority to address this kind of issue next. Uh, just the net last couple of slides, we have uh, resources. We invite anybody to use our resources for training and technical assistance. These are resources that, um, that are free of charge and uh, we hope you will take advantage. And we've listed our technology transfer centers and a number of evidence-based practice uh, uh, resources. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. Um, Smart Colorado, your advocacy is key. Uh, you are setting an example for groups across this country and I very much appreciate the opportunity to work with you. Thank you, uh, Dr. McCants Katz. You are truly a rock star. Um, your presentation was uh, amazing. Sadly, uh, I'm just overwhelmed by the negative data. Um, just to remind the rest of our, our hundreds of people that are watching, uh, what a big deal uh, Dr. Eleanor McCants Katz is. She runs uh, from a 20 story tower in suburban DC, uh, an organization, I think, with tens of thousands of employees. Uh, she is the leading person in our country on mental health and substance use and uh, Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services under two administrations. And we are thrilled uh, to have you uh, spend some time with us today. And we're gonna have time for some questions uh, in a little bit. So if you'd stick with us, uh, that would be great. And um, uh, we're now going to hear from a few members of our community and why they have been involved and support Smart Colorado's work. If you would just kind of give us in your own words what brought you into this issue, why it's important to you, and why you've hung with us. I've been involved with Smart Colorado for a long time, and I enjoy their mission and initiative to educate the public on marijuana, which I believe is very important and relevant not only to Colorado, but the U.S. as, as we know it, because we're a substance you sort of kind of society. And I think it's interesting to look at the relationship between substance use, happiness, um, income. There's a lot of issues that are related towards the consumption of marijuana. I was surprised with the passage of legalized marijuana in our state. And I, I didn't understand what was happening. I knew there was something bigger Smart Colorado gave me some of the educational tools that I needed to feel informed about the issues, to understand how to talk to my own teenagers and how to spread the word among my friends and support network. So, so other people became informed about the risks of marijuana. My involvement in Smart is part those years, I mean, we're talking now 30 years of sort of awareness around this topic that Peter Ubroth brought to the table was what it can mean in the workplace. And then in talking to educators, I've seen what it does to kids. And, and then as an ecclesiastical leader in my church, I've seen kids whose lives have totally gone off track because they got into marijuana. And I've seen good kids have their lives go completely off track. And the, the vehicle of them going off track was marijuana use. I think Smart Colorado is so important because legalized marijuana in our state is not going away. And we have to figure out how to live with it safely and sustainably. We're seeing marijuana be legalized all over the country. It's, it's a reality, and I don't think that's going to change. But this notion that it's 
harmless would be like suggesting that even though alcohol is legal, it also is harmless. It's important to educate people not only on what they're getting into, but the reasons in which um, the substance is used, why it's used, and the implications that string from that is connected to a lot of things. The issues of today aren't separate, they're interwoven. I've been involved um, simply because of my personal experience in my life, the way it's impacted some of my family members, things of nature, friends. Um, it's, it's been a journey. It's been a journey. Yes. You know, I think we have a key societal function to try to teach kids um, and parents about the dangers this, that this represents to young developing brains. So I'd ask everybody today to join me in making the most generous donation that they possibly can to SMART Colorado during this season of giving. I've known SMART to make excellent use of the funds that they receive, and I feel really confident about the return on investment that I've received and our foundation has received from their efforts. Be involved with Smart Colorado, regardless of what your stance is on marijuana abuse or substance abuse, things of that nature, is not to necessarily persuade or convey or conform you to our notion, ideology, and what you should do with it. Although we would hope you would uh, inspire a decreased usage in certain communities, but really it's to educate. Our new initiative out of Smart is called One Chance to Grow Up because today's youth, we we only get give them and they only get really one shot. We get one shot to grow up. And, and we deserve as a society to make sure that we give all kids, regardless of what obstacles might already face them, the best shot at, at a full and productive life to reach their fullest potentials, just like you have. And we're watching you grow up and it's been, it's been really neat to have you be a part of our team. And we just thank you so much and appreciate your wisdom and, 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 and as always your advice, because we really do listen to you and value your opinion. So thanks a mil. Thanks thank a mil. you. It's, it's been an honor to be a part of this journey. It's actually an honor to give money to a group of people who have for 10 years, probably more, just put one foot in front of the other to protect kids. They have been relentless. Um, they have been smart, intelligent connectors. Um, and again, it's just an honor to give to a group that has really put their heads down, done the work and continues to do the work. And so I will continue to support SMART and um, hope I can help in any way, shape or form. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Jaswan, Paul, Christina, and Robin, and Henny. Uh, that was really powerful. Um, 2021 will be a pivotal year for our new initiative, as you've heard, One Chance to Grow Up. Our work in Colorado will continue to educate and inform while mobilizing support to address Colorado's most concerning regulatory gaps. You may not know, but the state budget for marijuana prevention was cut by nearly 80% during COVID which makes ensuring better safeguards are in place more important than ever. We can't do this without your financial support. Depending upon the funds raised, we hope to hire a dynamite communications person, roll out the next phase of our new website and continue to share lessons learned and best practices to local communities throughout the state, other states and to national leaders. Please donate and share what you have learned here today with your friends and family and ask them to sign up for free updates via our website, One Chance to Grow Up. The more adults know, the better we can collectively protect kids and ensure that there are critical safeguards in place. It's now my distinct honor to introduce another rock star, Dr. Bonnie Halpern Felsher uh, from the other coast. Uh, we're pleased to have you with us today. Dr. Halpern Felsher is a professor of pediatrics at Stanford University in adolescent medicine and the founder and executive director of the Toolkits, which she's gonna tell you a little bit more. So Bonnie, uh, take it away. Great, thank you very much. Hopefully you can hear me and see my slides. Yes, we can do both. 
Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Doug, and for the entire group of Smart Colorado. And thank you for all the work that you do. You're amazing in getting the word out to really protect our young people. And that's what I'm about as well. So I uh, just want to give you a little bit of information very briefly. Um, Dr. McCants gave you the overview and an amazing talk on marijuana uh, at the national level as well as in Colorado. I'm just going to highlight a few additional pieces and some resources. So I am a professor in pediatrics and the founder and executive director of two toolkits, the Tobacco Prevention Toolkit and the Cannabis Awareness and Prevention Toolkit. So let's just very briefly hone in more on youth and particularly focusing around marijuana and vaping and vaping overall because that is a lot of our concern right now. Just want to show you some data from the national youth uh, marijuana use around, uh, excuse me, some data from the 2019 Monitoring the Future on the national youth marijuana use. And just to show you why we're so concerned, particularly around marijuana and youth. If you look at these data, we're looking at any or lifetime use, past use, past month use, the past 30 days, and daily use. And you can see across the board, eighth graders, which are generally middle school students, very young, are really starting to use marijuana at that age. So 15% of eighth graders have ever used, and, and um, they've used 6% have used in the past 30 days. When you move up to 12th grade, we're looking at almost 44% of 12th graders have used in their lifetime and looking at past month use. So if they've used any time in the past 30 days, 22% of 12th graders have reported using marijuana in the past 30 days and daily use over 6% of 12th graders and still a percent, some eighth graders are using daily. These are very, very high numbers that we should be concerned about. Now, if you look at tobacco use, and I say this because when we're talking about vaping, we're really worried about co-use of tobacco and marijuana. So let me briefly tell you about tobacco use and vaping tobacco right now. The 2019 national data from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey shows that the past 30 day use of tobacco was predominantly e-cigarettes, vaping. 30, almost 33% of high school students report using some form of of vaping e-cigarette use in the past 30 days. Now, good news is with the National Youth Tobacco Survey of 2020, that the use seems to have dropped a little bit to around 20%. However, a couple caveats there. That's still one in, one in five. It's still 20% of youth who are using vaping products. That amounts to over 3 million youth across the country. Not only that, those numbers are about the same that we saw in 2017 when our then FDA commissioner, uh, Dr. Gottlieb, and the Surgeon General said that we had a vaping epidemic. So these numbers, while maybe going down, are still very high. Plus, important to know that these numbers were only recently collected during the pandemic, and a lot of us think that the rates of vaping are going to go back up once students are back in school. So that's important to know. So now let's put these together and look at youth vaping and marijuana together. We see is that 33% of high school students who ever used e-cigarettes reported also using marijuana in their e-cigarette product. And we actually have data that show from our own data set that youth are taking like Juul, for example, a very popular e-cigarette device, opening it up which is concerning because just opening it exposes them to chemicals on their hands and putting in marijuana and using the device that way. 23% of middle school students who have ever used an e-cigarette also report putting marijuana into that e-cigarette. And these aren't vaping marijuana devices. This is they're buying a device for nicotine and using it for marijuana. And also important is youth who vape are three times more likely to use uh, cannabis or excuse me, to use marijuana than youth who are vape free. So the co-occurrence between these products is very concerning. And let me tell you about the health outcomes and also why we're concerned. So not only do we have very large numbers of youth who are using marijuana and often you vaping marijuana, but there are health outcomes around this. So you may have heard of something called EVALI. This is the e-cigarette or vaping associated lung illness. We started hearing about this around 2019. And 
And the latest data from the CDC, which were uh, collected in uh, February of, tw of uh, 2020, that's when the CDC stopped collecting data on Ivali. But the latest data show that almost 3,000 cases of Ivali have emerged. These are youth and adults who are sick from using vaping products, and some, almost 70, have died. Now, what we found is that, or what the CDC has found, is that their THC, the, the psychoactive component that's in the marijuana in most of these vaping devices, not all, but most. And it seems to be the vitamin E acetate, which is the oil, the substance that allows the THC to go from the mouth into the body and into the brain. That's the substance used to carry the, the uh, THC through the body. That seems to be causing the e volley. But we, the CDC stopped collecting data. I have lots of uh, physicians who study the lungs, who work with the lungs around young people who say, look, I've got a number of, of patients in my hospital who are youth who seem to have Evoli who are sick from using vaping cannabis and vaping e-cigarette products. So smoking and vaping and uh, COVID-19, let's talk about this. So we know that the lungs are weakened from breathing in smoke or aerosol. We know that from numbers of studies. We know also that the coronavirus uh, influences and attacks the lungs. So you, if you have weakened lungs, it stands to reason that you're going to be more likely to be infected if you smoke or vape any product, not just nicotine, marijuana as well. The other thing that concerns us if just bringing the vaping device or any smoking device, so if you're smoking can, uh, marijuana or you're vaping it, just that hand to mouth action, you touch a doorknob, you touch your device, you touch your um, marijuana cigarette and you put it to, to your mouth, you're increasing the chance of just getting exposed to the virus. And plus maybe taking your mask off while you're vaping or smoking. So these are a lot of our concerns. So you may have heard that we actually published a study in August in the Journal of Adolescent Health that showed, and this was on nicotine e-cigarettes, but we think that it may be true for anything that you're smoking or vaping, including marijuana, that youth who used, um, who used an e-cigarette device in the past 30 days were almost five times more likely to have symptoms of COVID, but more importantly, they were more likely to be tested and to be positive. So if adolescents and young adults, 13 to 24, were using an e-cigarette or using both cigarettes and e-cigarettes, they were five, time, five to seven times more likely to be diagnosed with COVID and seven times more likely if they use these products in the past 30 days. Again, some of this may be lungs, some of this may be the hand-to-mouth action or exposure. We don't know, more studies are needed. But clearly right now, if you're trying to understand why is this talk happening, why is Smart Colorado doing this in the midst of COVID, it's because we're concerned about lung health. Anything that anybody puts into their lung, particularly while they're young and while they're not only brains developing, but their lungs are developing is of concern. So just briefly to tell you about some resources, I mentioned our CAPT, we call it our Cannabis Awareness and Prevention Toolkit. You've got the uh, website down there. I'm gonna come and give more trainings on this to your health educators in future months, but just want you to know that this resource is there. It's meant for educators, but in all honesty, we have, ed we have healthcare providers, we have legislators, we have policymakers, we have many, many, many people who are using our materials to, to talk to youth to try to get them to stop using marijuana. So what's important about this is it's interactive. We've got lots of activities on there, uh, lots of PowerPoints. One of the things that we pride ourselves is in addition to our PowerPoints and information, we have activities that help adolescents really understand why marijuana is unsafe. We've got crash courses. So if you're trying to say, huh, can you educate me more so I can educate others? We've got that on there. We also have fact sheets. So wherever you are, you may be remote right now, but if you do have uh, an office where you can put up posters, please consider taking our fact sheets. They're free. Everything on here is free. Putting them, printing them large and putting them as posters online. So I want to thank you. And there is my email and I'm happy to take questions when ready. Fantastic. Uh, 
Dr. Bonnie Halpern Felsher is amazing. She also is a star. And so we do have time. We've got a few minutes for a few questions. Um, if you would use the Q&A function on Zoom and uh, send those in, um, we will go ahead and uh, endeavor to take your questions. And if we can't take them uh, during this time, we'll get back to you for sure with an answer. So I'm gonna start off uh, a question to uh, Dr. McCants Katz. Uh, if we can um, open up her video. Um, and it's basically, <laughs> you shared a lot of concerning information. What can we do? What can we do about it? Uh, you know, how can we better protect kids and consumers in this age of commercialized marijuana? Sure. Um, I, I really believe that um, marijuana is, uh, it, it, it's here to stay. Um, when I speak, I'm not um, trying to say that we should go back to prohibiting marijuana. I think it, it's here. Uh, it, it's going to be part of, of American society. And what we need to do is address safety issues because there's been virtually virtually no information available on the health risks associated with marijuana, particularly mental health risks of marijuana and risks by age. So that I think people really are not aware um, just um, how much risk is present in the potent marijuana use uh, that goes on today in so many parts of our country. Um, the, the way that we can do that again is is through is through education through um, through federal outreach such as I described through the work of, of organizations such as Smart Colorado. It's important that that kids and young adults know about uh, and adults know about the risks of marijuana. Um, we we really really need to regulate marijuana. I think one of the most important things we we need to do is to make our local, our state, our federal officials aware of the health risks associated with marijuana. Um, at this point, I, 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 sometimes it's, it's perplexing to me. I don't know whether, whether uh, elected officials simply aren't aware of the data or if the, if the idea of tax revenue is so enticing that, that we choose to look the other way. But, but the bottom line is, this is a, a substance that presents a lot of risk. And so it needs to be regulated. We need to regulate the amount of THC. We need to push that down. Um, it is very, very high in this country and uh, very intoxicating, very addictive, and um, for people vulnerable, will produce mental and substance use disorders. Um, regulation should include prohibiting advertising products, particularly products that would be attractive to kids. Um, I also think we have to do a lot of outreach to doctors and other clinicians so that they understand risks of marijuana and they can talk to youth and parents and people that uh, they treat as young adults or adults about marijuana use, screen for it, um, educate about it and, and evaluate it so that if a person appears to have a problem with marijuana, get them to the care and treatment that they need. You know, the, I, the, the last thing I'll say is that I know that there's a lot of interest in tax revenue from marijuana sales. But when you think about the devastation of people that are in motor vehicle accidents that will require lifetime care, uh, people who develop medical problems, psychiatric illnesses, um, people who lose cognitive function and need support. You can't, you can't get enough tax dollars to address those issues. Um, and, so, and so I think that where we have to get to is a balance. People are going, people do not want marijuana to be illegal. And people, there are people who clearly want to be able to use it, but let's give them the information they need to use it safely. And let's really try to keep it out of, out of the hands of our children. And also remember that the adult, the brain does not stop development until age 25. So one of the reasons I really focused on 18 to 25 year olds is because the, the data coming back on marijuana use is very, very concerning. And these are in effect, um, people who we call them legally adults, 
but in terms of physiology, they've not finished development. So they are at risk. Um, all of those things, long way of saying, let's regulate marijuana and, and do what we need to do to increase safety by giving people the information they need to make good choices. Um, and, and I would just say the way to do that is through it, groups like yours. Um, you all have the, the ability to speak to um, leaders. Um, you are uh, the people that live in your communities and can tell them what's going on the ground all the time, uh, the concerns you have. That's very important information. And so I would just thank you all for the work you do and, and tell people in other states how to do it so that we really have a big national effort in this area. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Uh, Halpern Felscher, we have a few questions off of the Q&A for you. Um, first is, uh, uh, what advice and recommendations do you have for parents in how to discuss with kids, especially during the pandemic, the dangers of vaping? Related to that, how important is it for parents to model positive behavior in front of their kids? And then another question, why did the CDC stop collecting the Evali data? Great, thank you all. Great questions. I think I'll go backwards, but please don't remind me if I miss anything. Um, why did the CDC stop collecting Evali data? I don't know. It's a good question for them, uh, but I will tell you that I think it has to do with the fact that you know we're in a crisis around COVID, um, and that maybe no new information would be obtained by additional data because the the CDC was collecting the data largely to really figure out not just the prevalence but also the cause. I wish, and I really do wish that uh, the CDC would continue to collect information on Evali and really try to trace back whether it's nicotine e-cigarettes, marijuana vaping products, and then to really try to disaggregate and discern Evali versus COVID because we do know that the symptoms are fairly similar on presentation. And even if you look at x-rays, the lungs look fairly similar. And so it's really important for us as scientists and also for public health to really collect data to try to understand the differences between these. I'm not saying that people are confusing them, but I think it'll help us understand the exposure and differences in presentation and how to treat um, these two, particularly around youth who are using these uh, vaping products. In terms of how parents can talk, um, you know, I love what Dr. McCants Kantz was saying. You know, I think parents also need to become educated. They need to understand what youth are using. They need to understand the different kinds of marijuana products that are out there. You know, as was heard earlier, it's not just, it's, first of all, it's not your grandma's or your uh, vaping device, I mean, uh, uh, tobacco device or marijuana device or potency that was happening in you know, the 60s. It's 10 times more potent. And so parents need to understand that and they need to talk to their children about it and just be very upfront. And if you're, for example, listening to the, this website, I always say, find a time to talk about it where it comes out naturally. It's not good to say, boy, I'm going to schedule a talk on, you know, December 21st, we're going to sit down at noon and have this conversation. No, have it come out organically. So I happen to hear a talk from Smart Colorado about the, the risks of marijuana. Did you know this son or daughter? I heard about vaping. Are you, do you know about it? And not explicitly saying, are you using? Because or don't say, are, you know, you're not using, are you? Because what are they going to say? No, I am, mom. It's just a way, you know, they get, kids don't want to say that. They don't want to disappoint you. So have it come out organically. What do you know? What have you heard? This is what I'm concerned about. Now, as I was saying before, use COVID as a perfect time to talk about brain development and lung development and how we have to keep you protected until at least 25. Now, I'm not saying that at 25, you're saying, yay, go have a good time. I don't mean that. But this is the time to have that conversation and be most protective of our bodies from adolescence into that very young adult period. In terms of resources, Smart Colorado has amazing resources for you and they're a fantastic wealth of information. And again, we're happy to have you come on and use our toolkit, it's completely free. We have a lot of discussion guides and talking points that you can use. I think it's really important when we talk to youth, be honest, 
explain to them the harms. Don't overdo it because youth are aware of that. If you say, you know, if if you vape uh, uh, marijuana, you're going to die. No, that you know that that kind of exaggerated doesn't help. Give them honest facts. Let them know. Let them know about their vulnerabilities, and then tell them how they're being targeted by the flavors, by the marketing, all the things that Dr. McCann Katz talked about, all the different ways that they're being targeted. That it's a unregulated market right now and it's a revenue stream. And I always say to teens, do you want to be that next generation to give the money back to that industry? Wouldn't you rather use the money for something else? Those are the kinds of ma messages that adolescents hear. And that's important. Did I get all three I questions? We, I think you did. And <laughs> we're just about out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we promised all of you that we keep this under an hour. And so uh, we're going to wrap up here. I, I want to thank so much um, our two esteemed panelists today, also those that participated in the videos, and our great team at Smart Colorado. And uh, you didn't get to see Diane on video, but she is the heart and soul of our our group and uh, so appreciate her involvement here as well as Henny and Rachel. You didn't get to see her also. She's played a major role at, as well as uh, Henny and Julie and Jennifer and Nicole. Uh, thank you for allowing this to happen today. And we hope that all of you have learned something new, uh, something uh, valuable about the importance of our mission. Thousands of kids in Colorado and many more nationally are having their futures compromised because of the misinformation and lack of leadership uh, provided from the adults that they look to. Highly potent marijuana is damaging their lives and we can do something about it. It starts with getting the truth out there about the dangers of these products and their potencies and then shepherding changes in regulations to give kids a chance your support today will make a difference in the lives of countless kids. Let's get ahead of this while we still can. After all, kids only have one chance to grow up. Thank you very much for your time. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.